Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails New Social Environment. My name is Madeline, and I have the pleasure of being your MC today for an extremely important conversation on two recent exhibitions on the history of incarceration in Louisiana. Chandra McCormick and Keith Calhoun's Slavery, the Prison Industrial Complex, and the Ford Foundation's Persister Incarcerated Women of Louisiana. Um, we'll quickly pin the videos of everyone joining us today. Uh, first of all, we're thrilled to be joined by photographers Keith and Chandra. Um, Sophia will pin the videos now. Hi, Keith and Chandra, welcome. Um, and they will be in conversation with Andrea Anderson, the founding director of the Rivers Institute for Contemporary Art and Thought. Andrea, we are so happy to have you here today too. Uh, Sophia will pin your video now. Um, so Andrea, Keith and Chandra, we're all so glad you are here today. Um, and so next we have the Persister team and we're joined with Sarita Steib, the founder and executive director of Operation Restoration. Hi, Sarita. Uh, Dolphinette Martin, um, the housing director of Operation Restoration. Ron Theron Ratcliffe, uh, a mixed media sculptor and visual artist, Ron Bichet. Uh, Sarita, Dolphinette, Ron Theron, and Ron will be in conversation with Monica Ramirez Montagut, uh, the director of the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum. Uh, so just a few quick notes before we get the ball rolling. I'm sure everyone who's tuned into these talks in the past knows this spiel, but we will be recording this gathering for the Rail Archive. If you would prefer not to be seen, you can disable your camera by pressing the stop video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. And now to introduce Andrea, who will lead our conversation with Keith and Chandra about their work. Andrea Anderson is the founding director and chief curator of the Rivers Institute for Contemporary Art and Thought. She's the co-curator of the forthcoming exhibition, Sanford Bigger's Code Switch, opening in September at the Bronx Museum, and the co-editor of the eponymous publication from Yale University Press. She's tuning in today from Louisiana, where there is a big storm. So we'll stay in tune for any, any sort of audio problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking um, everyone at the rail for welcoming us and inviting us to hold this conversation today, and particularly to Madeline Cravens and Sophia Pedlov for all the care you put into the organization of it. Um, everyone but for rail staff who's participating uh, today is zooming in from somewhere in New Orleans. Uh, we live in a state with the highest incarceration rate in the country, with the highest incarceration rate in the world. So we're not surprised to find that the artists in our community have been documenting and contending uh, with this culture of incarceration for some time. And we're not surprised to hear that the art uh, and time of this place not only maps a social structure, but also speaks in intimate tones. This is an issue that is at once everywhere and always right here at home. So in this conversation, I am really proud to welcome two friends and artists here in the New Orleans community, Chandra McCormick and Keith Calhoun. I've had the honor of organizing an exhibition of, of their work three years ago. As a husband and wife team, Chandra and Keith have been documenting Louisiana and its people for more than 25 years. It's music culture, brass bands, jazz funerals, social and pleasure clubs, benevolent societies, and Black Mardi Gras Indians, and its religious and spiritual ceremonies throughout the community. Keith and Chandra have documented the soul of New Orleans and a vanishing Louisiana, the last of the sugarcane workers, the dock workers, the sweet potato harvesters, and the displacement of African Americans after Katrina. And they have sustained an ongoing series of photographs taken at the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. The prison was once a plantation known as Angola for the country of origin of most of the enslaved people who worked the land. Spanning 18,000 acres, it is larger than the island of Manhattan. It is also the largest maximum security prison in the United States. It is sometimes called the farm because it still produces about 4 million pounds a year of cash crop supported by the labor of inmates. Keith and Chandra, can you share a little bit more about the origins of this series and how you came to begin to take photographs here? Well, the way I was introduced, um, Keith, Keith started out earlier, he started in the late 70s going to Angola and um, in 1980 when I worked with him I I did a lot of printing and assisting and so I became familiar with the work and then I began to also go to Angola as well um, documenting Keith, I remember you talking about a French photographer in, in long ago, we were first started talking about these conversations. Who, who was that photographer and how did that relationship begin? 
Okay. Uh, Bernard Herman. <laughs> Bernard Herman was a French photographer. We met. Uh, we happened to meet him actually at KMB Camera Store. And the story was that he, you know there was a box of paper that we were going to get, and Bernard was there, and there was one box on the shelf, and Keith raced to get it, but he was standing right there, and he got it first. So, and then we all met and became friends, and we started shooting. And Bernard um, was essential because. Um, writing to the prison as a French journalist, um, he was able to get in because he had many books under his belt as well. Um, and um, he Keith suggested, you know, just through us talking, you know, he was photographing certain things on New Orleans, and so Keith said, "Why don't you, why don't you write a letter to get us in Angola prison?" And um, he said, "Angola, oh yeah." So he got the letter written. And that, that's how it all started. We were able to go. Bernard Herman was, a, to us, a photographer who had traveled many countries. And he had a great influence on me and Chandra. And, and his interest, he was doing a book on New Orleans. But when he got to see the black side of New Orleans, he started hanging out with us. And then it, it led into a relationship because Bernard taught us about the light and what it takes to make pictures. So, you know, it was many evenings. Chandra, at that time, she was doing more of the printing, but she was observing everything. So as time progressed, we was able to gain friendship in Angola. We met with Rito, who was running an angle light. Um, Norris Henderson, who was involved in changing conditions in Angola. So it wasn't like we just went to Angola one day and just shot guys hanging behind bars. We met guys who were changing conditions in Angola. And through that, it had a great influence on our insight, on our perspective on how to shoot from inside, you know, to try to come as close as showing what it's like for being inside Angola. So when you see our work come straight from where we feel it come from, you know, all our life, we grew up hearing about in our community, so we knew about the boss on horse. So it was quite naturally um, some of the images that we shot at that time um, became significant in our collection because, you know, as we go by now, you know, we see ain't nothing changed. So it's um, like if you, when you go there, to me, to look at that imagery. If you are a visualist, you won't want to do anything but capture that because it's stepping back it, in time. Yeah, it's a step back in time. So, you know, to me, it's it was just inevitable to get those type of pictures because of what it is. It's there. How much access were you given when you? I mean, when you enter into, I mean, and and has that changed over the time? Where you're able to go, whom you're able to to capture? Well, and go like that time it wasn't like much because they had a lot of guys that were doing things constantly always something was going on in Angola for us uh with production Gary Tall and them produced plays they had people doing things there so it wasn't like you was just cut off they you know some of the guys in Angola I met um they were coming out in the community doing things so it wasn't like we didn't you know in our last days a document in Angola um seen um, Gary Tyler come home from an instant, you know, the love that I've seen. i never seen men show so much love with each other. Well, well um, Everybody was happy for him, the warden, you know, everyone. Yeah, um, I mean, Norris Henderson and what is his other brother, Kelvin Cat Duncan. Calvin Duncan. These brothers, we was with them one day watching them go from St. Charles Parish back to the prison and get this brother and bring him home. You know, i never seen that type of love even out here in the free world. So, uh, you know, I just think we was fortunate to meet guys that were involved in, in changing the conditions in the prison and, and had an insight on giving us insight on how to doc, you know, you know, what was our perspective to photograph. Keith, I want to I want to take this moment. You you, uh, you both realized a film in 2019 um, about about his release, and maybe we can pause right here and show a little bit of, from that film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No 
to rise no more. Yes, yeah, all right. And if you rise in the morning, mm, bring judgment day. Oh, good God. Make me sound way back on there. Sound like it's good old times. It was soon one morning when the sun is rise and I was thinking about my good looking baby I would hang my head and cry so long son. Go down old hand please don't rise no more. And if you do rise in the morning, set this world on fire. If you had been on the river somewhere 19 and 10, they were driving the women just hard as they do the men. That was the first part on um, Gary. Can you tell us a little bit more about Gary Tyler and Norris Henderson? Uh, but you didn't show the piece of Gary. No, it's okay. Oh. Um, I, I'll just tell you like how I, Gary Tyler and I are one year apart in age. And I can remember him being arrested and incarcerated almost like it was yesterday when you know, you know when he was young at 16 17 years old and um there was a big movement in louisiana across you know, the country really yeah exactly the free the gary tyler movement and so many people from new orleans that i know were on board and they were persistent and they were steadfast and stood with him every step of the way um his lawyers um some sisters from here that that would go and visit them in you know Kambuka. just Kambuka. yeah they would just go and visit and you know then gary with his play he he would come out to the community and and do things like that i just and i became we became a part of his case early on and so it it just meant a lot to us, and we really never gave up hope that he would but, get out. But one of the greatest things that we met, we met people like Gary and Norris, who all worked together. I think Norris, he was in the law. And these brothers, like I say, they wasn't in Angola just playing chess and checkers. They were doing things with art and theater. I mean, some of them met. I mean, we got artists in Angola who would love to have a, a show on Brooklyn Rail or whatever, but I'm saying we got so many talented locked up and we was fortunate to try to integrate our you know involved with people who are doing things in the prison and we don't get to see that we don't get to hear the stories that uh like norris his organization vote you know these brothers out here getting people to vote you know i mean we need that's the that's the call right now the only way we're gonna change but imagine a man who spent his life in jail consistently out changing things in the community consistently uh, going back to Angola. Every time I photograph them, they go and get somebody else. To me, those are our heroes that, 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 that the young kids in our community need to know, hey, we got men who was incarcerated and, and while they was there, they got it together to come back here to do things. So we don't see those images right now in our community because I mean, I'm, I'm glad my work been to the Venice Miami, but it's good when kids in my community can walk in my studio and see people that they know and say, hey, that ain't nowhere to be. So it's important that me and Shonda, we at the age now, we have to pass it on because so much is changing in the, in the photo world. You know, these cell phones is a weapon now. So we just have to teach our kids how to engage with the camera. But I was fortunate as a young photographer to meet people like Bernard Herman, who was here from all the way from Paris, France, documenting New Orleans history and culture. So that made me know it. 
hey, I need to step up my game because if somebody coming that far to be in doc, it's necessary that we in our community to own ourselves and become keepers of our culture. So that's that's been our involvement. But we've been fortunate to meet so many talented people coming from the um from the prison till right now. We need help for housing, you know, where they're gonna come at right now, you know, that's the main question now. Let me ask you some, you know, in 2018, uh, I had the great privilege, privilege of working with you all to organize the exhibition Labor Studies. Um, and in that show, we uh, included a number of series of your works from the dock workers, sugar cane and, and sweet potato farmers, hospitality workers, um, also undocumented and unprotected workers after Katrina. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit at the center of that when we when you walked through that exhibition, um, actually the last uh, photographs you saw before entering a central room were were those images of many workers who had come to New Orleans, uh, predominantly through Mexico, uh, to help rebuild New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, those are the last photographs that you had taken that we included in the show. And then you entered into a central room and in that room we included uh, photographs from the Angola series. Can you talk a little bit about what it means for you um, to think about the Angola photographs in relationship to the larger histories of labor in New Orleans and Louisiana broadly? Well, you want me to... Well, I feel that uh, my work was always around labor. Um, and it's all related to me, you know, the, the, the work of, on the docks. My father was a dock worker, and so I grew up with men who worked. They were men in this night ward who went to day, walked to the river, and made life, you know, for, for us. But we don't see enough for us workers. Work. People who built this city now, you know, things didn't change in the city, where even with the musicians now, they don't even want to hardly play on the streets anymore. So a lot of things that we once had, like when my father was on the docks, um, you had men involved in changing life in the community. You know, it was about buying land and lots and houses. I don't see young people doing some of the things at that time. So by us growing up with workers, Shonda Muzzle was a seamstress and a dressmaker. Yeah. So we had people all around our life, I guess, work. So when I went on the docks, it wasn't no problem with me to go out in the ship hole because the men knew my father. He said, well, that's Calhoun's son. You know, they didn't understand that, that I was documenting the demise of the labor force they, they didn't they thought I was some union man company man watching on you know so at that time uh it was me and Bernard at that time would go on the docks early in the morning we just ride up and down and shoot the guys working in, in the holes and um and to me at that time that type of photography you know it's just something you do from your heart you know it wasn't about you know, I didn't have no assignment from the picking you on any type of job. And a lot of times we would just go out and shoot. But I was fortunate that my father was a dock worker and we had a lot of friends. Um, same thing, we went to Angola, you know, we live, we live on both sides of the lens here. You know, when we go to Angola, we know some of them same guys in Angola might be doing life for murder, but their mother might be the mother of the church that we go to up the street. So it's not like when we go there, we just some out town tourist photographer. We know the people there, you see. You know, also yeah. sometimes when you go, I'm sorry, go ahead, Angela. No, I was I, just I, gonna say, sometimes when we go, uh, we, we may get messages from family members to bring back to them or them yeah. give us messages to give to the family members because we know them. I, I was going to say that you know there's a, this powerful sense of echo and repetition in your work, and uh, from even from one series to another, there, there's certain kinds of formations or arrangements of people that, you know, having spent a lot of time looking through your archive, that that I, I see again and again. And they, you know, one of the things that um, the way that you shape your subjects, um, one of the things it does is that it really reveals kinds of social patterns that, that are repeating um, and also relationships between different subject matters. Um, it's really hard to, you know, when we were, when we did the labor show together, it it's feels impossible to separate out the images of the sugarcane workers on former plantations um, in the river parishes 
from some of the images of inmates working in Angola. Um, are you registering those echoes when you're when you're photographing? Is that are the are all of the photographs you've ever taken before kind of part of um, part of that moment when you see when you look at new subjects? Yes, I I I I think we do photograph with that thought because you know work the people working in the fields they they work. I mean, they work just as hard as those guys working in Angola and working and taking pictures of sugarcane. Angola's got sugarcane too. That's one of the hardest crops, you know. Um, they would say, you know, that you, you would never as a slave wanted to be sold to a sugarcane plantation because the work was so brutal. They gave you 10 years to live. You know, yeah, sugar cane was brutal. But you know, I can take you right now in places in Louisiana, you know, where women are struggling just as hard as men in Angola, where they got lights and certain things. So if you go through the landscape of Louisiana, I mean, on these back roads that we documented, ain't nothing really much changed from what I see. It's even got really worse. So, so far as conditions, because when you're living now on the back road, we photograph from rural parishes, there ain't no more sugarcane workers when you got private owned prisons now and that's the business now that's that's the incubator for for free labor so it ain't it's worse you know i don't know i i was looking at parchment prison and guys in angola i mean they've got a lot of better life in certain parts of the way things are going in this country that people are not even showing so well there's more activity but in for angola. a struggle right now if you're a mother working on living in back rural Louisiana, nine out of 10, you working at a prison. So your life is around the prison now. So there ain't no economic engine gonna really pull you out of that situation. And so it's a bad situation for, I mean, we doing the dog in New Orleans, but you go you go on some of them pastures right now and see what, what, what it's like. Yeah, I'm not asking a question. I think some of the, the you know, most striking photographs um, or uh, destabilizing photographs, I think, um, are some of the ones from uh, the Angola Rodeo. Um, that is a very difficult thing to describe to someone who has never seen this. And uh, maybe we can show one of the images um, that we have, that there are from the, included from the rodeo. I think they're towards the end. Here's one in color. Both of the ones in color actually go up a bit. Um, yeah, so there are two color photographs here, eight and ten, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what we're looking at here? John. Okay, what's happening in this image? I mean, yeah, I mean, if you can talk a little bit about the experience of capturing the rodeo and what that, what that event is for people who don't know. Um, the, the event is similar to like Roman Gladiator. It's um, it's kind of it's it's brutal. Like here, what they're doing in this, they're about this horse is untamed, so they're gonna let him out. Someone is gonna ride him, so he's supposed to, I guess, stay on the horse as long as he could. The horse is just um, gonna buck. But I mean, like the the games that that are that are in, in Angola are brutal. You know, they have the the poker game where men sit four men sit at a table that has no legs. So their laps are the legs and the bull comes out and he charges the table. So the last man sitting at the table supposedly wins the prize, but all, you know, you get hurt. There's a friend of ours who's incarcerated, Henry James, who talks about that. Um, he, you know, he said that guys do those things to make money. A lot of times they don't have funds in their box or they don't have may not have family still sending them money and they join and do the rodeo to make money because each game um, warrants a cash prize um, but he had his shoulder dislocated in there so they have accidents and things happen um, that that in, in the prison maybe you can take a couple of two images later um, at the same time that the rodeo is presented, there's also an art fair, yeah? Yes, there is. Um, so a lot of the guys who are artists, 
and make, make product, um, they're able to sell it. And so there's a huge tent that has different tables um, with their goods to sell. Um, and yeah, they're able to do that. And we're told that the prison gets a percentage of uh, sales as well. Um. And this image, I, I, I think that to me, I love his eyes, but I think he's, he's saying, Father, forgive them, the, the prison system, you know, they know not what they do or whatever. I think he's, that's, that's, that's what he's saying to me. There are these photos that you've taken over the years that are, you know, document the, the internal life of Angola, um, both in terms of daily life, the rodeo, um, but also you have followed many of the inmates on the occasions where they are uh, reconnected with their family. A lot of family comes up for rodeo day and that's, you know, that's one of the, um, one of the opportunities of that day is that there, there are families that can come together around it. Um, that's the best thing I can say about that day. But um, I think you also have been able to document inmates who return home for, you know, funerals of their family for brief periods. Um, can you talk about that, that, that photography of those kinds of intimate um, experiences that you have been able to capture um, and the relationships that you've been able to build outside of, of Angola proper? Well, yeah. Again, like we said, we live on both sides of the land. So a lot of times in our community, when it's nothing to go to in a community to see some uh, a truck, pull up with a man being escorted with shackles to a funeral because that's probably the last time they would see their mother or their relative. So it becomes a very important in, in, in our documentation because we show what the family going through. You know, we see the pain and the suffering or maybe the stress of the mother been worrying for her family, you know. So I thought that me and Chandra, you know, we, you know, we want to show it in a way that that it connects because I think when guys in prison lose family members such as mothers and fathers, like they lose the whole back, you know, they support, you know, so I think necessary. And then it gives him a chance to bind with family because you imagine, you know, I don't see guys get to bind in the prison enough with the, with the children. You know, you got men in Angola right now where you got father and son, you know, that's the only time these guys seen their father once they get incarcerated, but at the family gathering, that's it. That might be the last time he come home, you know, for his mama or his daddy. So we we, we knew guys in our community that were uh, in Angola and we know people say uh, so-and-so coming home and we would go and photograph that moment. I think that's necessary to show. You know, and just showing guys sitting in the cell block. I got one guy I knew, Glenn, he was in the cell block at the same time he came home like a month later and his mother had passed. So, you know, we photographed that and, and it connects, you know, so. And these are people that live in our, you know, that live yeah. in our community, the families. You know, we've been blessed to go that I was subject every day. I tell Sean is an hour front door. So, you know, we can get out and make images, you know, right now it's a little difficult you know, with this COVID, but hopefully we get back to normal one day. But no, I think me and Chandra, we was young. And believe me, having Chandra as a, as, as a person behind me, no way in the world we could have done this work because photography is expense. And we don't get opportunities to get into big publications all the time. And, and you know, we just have to have a passion for what we do. But we've been fortunate to, you know, they're hanging here together, you know. So I just want to tell her that, you know. Well, I, I do want to say, you know, we are, we have been so grateful and, and fortunate in New Orleans to be able to, to see your photographs here that, you know, all of this work has first been seen in New Orleans. Um, in, I think it's in Prospect 3, Franklin Sermons included uh, part of the series uh, in, in Prospect. And then it was later, as you mentioned, in Oakley and Resorts uh, Biennale. 
Um, soon it will open, I don't know when, but uh, at PS1 um, as part of uh, Marking Time, Art in the Age of, of Mass Incarceration. And I'm curious to hear a little bit for you. I know what this means, this work means for you to have it be in this community for, for, the, communi for the children of New Orleans whom you also teach um, uh, to encounter this body of work. How do you think it gets read from outside um, and, and why is it important to you when it travels? Well, yeah. it, I'll say something and you can't. I think um, it gives the world, I mean, just when the, thank, uh, you know, again, thanks to Oakley because he bought our work for the world to see and through that it went to the Frisk. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan Edwards, they came and, and made sure that this work, it, it just let us know they got people out there look, listening and looking. So, you know, you never know when you're making work where it's going to go. You know, when we were started shooting Angola, when me and Bernard Herman years went back to Angola, and now we still going, we still have relationship with guys like Norris and these guys who continue to work in the prison. So uh, even, that, even a lawyer, Mary, you know, who call us to make sure that we document it, Gary, you know? So it's like, we've been blessed to have people in the community that we do and, and, and continue to give us the support. And I think it, it's, it needs to be more of us young, we need more young artists, people of color documenting uh, us right now, because these are times of changing, the city have changed, like as me as a photographer, we, we, with gentrification, the city don't even have the flavor. Like at one time, you can just walk into a man and get something to eat, didn't even know folk did feature. So now you walk through these neighborhoods, they're so sterile. So I'm glad now that we, that we were able to capture those days of people hanging out on, on the steps and looking out screen doors. And I think that, um, I think that it's, it was good to go international because oh it's a, a broad, People actually who never would have dreamed of anything like like that got, to, got a chance to see it. Um, and because it went international, it was publicized right here for us about, about the exhibition going over there. So a lot of people here in the States got to see it. I mean, it's just publicized widely and it's yeah. such an important subject. People well, needed right. to know about that and hear about that. Um, before we before we um, open the conversation and, and talk more about another exhibition in t that was recently realized in New Orleans, I want to show a few minutes um, again from your film. Um, a little bit later in that, um, show Gary Tyler's return to his family community. Actually, can I, may I ask you to pull back just a little bit before there's a, there's a recitation um, that I'd really love to close on that Gary spoke. It's right just after this, yeah. In competition with no one. <laughs> Our desire to be better today than I was yesterday. We have done so much. We have done so much. With so little. With, with so, so little, little. For so long. For so, so long, long. That we are now qualified. That we are now qualified to do anything. To do anything. With nothing. With nothing. Yeah. That's 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 that. <laughs> and I'm going to take and recite this. I am the willing. I am the willing. Doing the impossible. Doing the impossible. For the ungrateful. For the ungrateful. I have done so much. I have done so much. With so little. With so little. For so long. For so long. And I am. That I am. Qualified. Qualified. To do anything. To do anything. With nothing. With nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Chandra, so much for sharing a little bit about this project. Um, and I am also so happy to introduce my colleague, uh, Monica Ramirez Montague, um, who until just a few weeks ago served as director of the Newcomb Art Museum at Tulane University here in New Orleans, and has now taken the helm at the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum in Michigan. Um, together with Dolphinette Martin and Sarita Stibe, you curated the exhibition, Persister Incarcerated Women of Louisiana, which first opened at Newcomb and just prior to the pandemic's closures in March, opened to the public for a few brilliant days at the Ford Foundation New York. Um, Monica, I'm so glad to be in conversation with you again before you leave New Orleans um, and to hear you speak more about Persister. Can we hear you? Uh, Monica, you should be able to unmute yourself right now. There, there we go. I was blocked, <laughs> right? Okay. I was not able to unmute myself, but thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today with us. Indeed, um, I was born in Mexico, so I bring to the table quite the opposite point of view from the work of Keith and Chandra, which is from the inside out a little bit, like they serve at both sides of the lens, like they, what they said repeatedly. Uh, as an outsider, as a newcomer to Louisiana, I was intrigued by the fact that Louisiana is known as a prison capital of the world. And why is that? The United States is, uh, incarcerates most of its population than any other developed country in the world. Um, so, I, you know, as someone that was coming to Louisiana, to live in Louisiana, I was wondering why that was and doing a little bit more research. Uh, and what this means is that one in 75 Louisiana residents are currently in the prison system, one in 75 which means that at least one or two people in this group of folks here right now on Zoom would actually be incarcerated if we were in, all from Louisiana. The impact that that has in the community is tremendous. Doing a little bit more research, uh, we realized uh, with our partners, Sirita, Steve, and Dolphinette Martin, we realized that the population that's increasing in incarceration nationwide is a population of women and girls. In the last 40 years, there's been an increase of 834% of women incarcerated in the United States. Women have not changed 834% in the last 40 years in order to now become like the increasing population of incarcerated people in the United States. So that was a little bit of the premise of what took us to say, we, we, we wanna know who these women are. What were their conditions at the moment of their encounter with the justice system? Acknowledging that we in the museum don't have that directly, we're not directly impacted in the staff, we don't have the lived experience, we don't have a competency to tell the story of these women for them. We invited two uh, directly impacted women, Sirita Staib and Dolphinette Martin, to join us as co-curators of the exhibition. And Sirita and Dolphinette were at the table when we made the most important decisions for the exhibition. And they, at, at to a point where they said, well, we wanna be surprised when we walk into the exhibition. So at some point they let the museum go and do the design and do the hanging of the art. But up to that point, they were involved in every single step of the, of the decision making for this exhibition. So in that context, I would like to actually invite my colleagues, Sirita Steiff and Dolphinette Martin uh, to tell us a little bit more of what, um, you know, what was the benefit of, of partnering with a museum to tell their stories and what the journey was uh, of, you know, directly impacted folks to come and work with an institution to hopefully together accurately present their stories with them. So I, I want to invite my colleague Sarita to, to, to just uh, join us in the conversation as well as Dolphinet, and I will pass the microphone over to them. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, the experience with Tulane ended up being in a, the Newcomb Art Museum, ended up being an amazing experience. It didn't start off that way. It took us about two to three years for us to come to some terms and agreements about things that um, should and should not happen. I think one of the first hurdles that we had to jump over was language and how we um, speak and talk about women who are incarcerated. Um, I often tell the story that uh, for 10 years, I was incarcerated from the age of 19 until 29. I had never heard my first name. So the term inmate for us is very dehumanizing and convict or, you know, all of the terms that they use to erase your identity. 
So for me, uh, when I got out, I didn't even respond to Sariga. So when my mom or my sister or someone would say, Sariga, I wouldn't even turn around because for 10 years, my name was erased. So we wanted to start at the lens with the museum of having all of those perspectives, all of those views to be very drawn into um, the stories and the paintings and the videos and the songs. Um, Tulane traditionally did not have a great reputation in our community. So one of the first things that Monica, myself, and Dolphinette really wanted to address was how could we get women to buy in and start trusting an institution that traditionally in our community was built, <clears throat> excuse me, um, off the backs of slavery, you know, um, and also that the community in which the university resides in also is not accessible to the community that it lives in. So how could we start integrating those things, how we could bring in community to have a voice in the say-so of the museum and the exhibit. So Dolphinette and my task initially were to reach out to the women and identify formerly incarcerated women with our partners at Women With A Vision um, to identify women who could be a part of the exhibit and begin to have them to trust Tulane through the work that we do in the community and our um, initial thought process of how everything happened. So I'll let Dolphinette take it from there because I don't want to take up too much time because <laughs> I will talk. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I am Dolphinette Martin and I am a former incarcerated woman who served a combined 12 years of incarceration. Uh, I will just echo what Sarita said about how this project came to be uh, the time that it took for us to get, get to a place where we and I, you know, in all honesty and trans, complete transparency, uh, it wasn't that we trusted Tulane, the trust was with Monica. And uh, Monica being an employee of Tulane, uh, I guess the premise was that we trusted Tulane, but we really didn't trust Tulane, we trusted Monica. Uh, and so the women trusted us. And so because they knew through our relationship, through the work we do in the community, through our refusal to uh, be exploited or allow them to be exploited, they knew that when we came to the table with them or when we went to the table without them, their best interest was always what we went with. So it was easier for them to come on board knowing that Sarita and I were on board. Uh, again, I'll echo uh, what Sarita said about the community in which uh, Tulane is surrounded by. You know, I was born and raised not far from there, which uh, at the time was called the Calio Housing Project, which was one of the most notorious housing projects in the city of New Orleans. And it was understood that not only did you not go uh, on Tulane's campus, but there was like this six block radius that you better not get caught on or you would definitely either be killed or incarcerated. And so again, to have women work with us uh, to incorporate this project in Tulane's uh, Newcomb Art Museum, it was pretty easy because they saw Sarita and I as trusted uh, sisters and we trusted Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Sirita and Dolphinette. Um, yes, the bulk of the work of this exhibition was done behind the scenes, and it was done by building bridges of trust and uh, that were only being possible by being vulnerable, all of us, the folks working in the institution, uh, which was a similar process that the artists had to engage with their persisters. And I wanna get also to the two artists that are joining us today. The museum then first uh, uh, invited Sirita and Dolphinette to co-curate the exhibition with us every step of the way. And then we, they, um, Sirita and Delphinette brought a group of formerly incarcerated women to work with us. The museum identified a group of artists. The museum staff interviewed 
the formerly incarcerated women and then passed those interviews to 30 local artists with the idea that they would turn those interviews into these artworks and they would translate these stories into artworks. The artists had the opportunity, if the women that now call themselves her sisters, like the title of the exhibition, if the women wanted to meet their, uh, their artists and we, we made a selection, we asked the women choose, you know, here's a portfolio of the 30 artists, 25 visual artists, uh, five musicians, choose your top three and we will match you as, as much as possible. So that's how that process went. They had the opportunity to say, yes, I would like to meet the artist that's assigned to my story. And then it's interesting because the same labor of trust and, uh, and building that trust that we did at an institutional level with, our, with Sirita and Dolphinet was a similar journey that the artists had to then engage with their persisters and then get to meet them in order to accurately represent them through their artwork. So the artists, uh, there was also a lot of, of work there between the persisters and the artists. So I wanna, um, I wanna uh, hear from Ron Theremin, Ron, who are artists that work with their persisters to create the artworks. But I do wanna say that when Sirita and Dolphinet identified a community of formerly incarcerated women to work with us, we decided on four things that we were going to ask of the women to answer for us to make sure that the visitors to the museum, that like Chandra and Keith say, a lot of folks just do not know that this is happening uh, in America. Uh, what, are, what were the four things that folks needed to know about mass incarceration in the United States before leaving the exhibition? So we did develop together a chapter on the root causes for incarceration when we, when, where the, what came out of, of that research was the understanding that most of the women at their moment of encounter with the justice system are actually victims themselves. Either they're victims of substance abuse that has gone untreated there can be victims of domestic violence, partner abuse. Uh, there are women that 60% of them are unemployed at the time of their incarceration. For example, 80% of the incarcerated women are mothers. So we wanted to hear about that. So we just wanted to know the root causes uh, for these 834% of increase of the incarceration of women. We did a chapter on that. We asked the women that. We asked also the, the women that interviewed that were mothers uh, how was, uh, you know, having to be a mother long distance in most cases, some of the federal prisons, there's no federal prisons in Louisiana, they're in different states. Then we also asked the women to tell us about the physical, behavioral, and health toll of being women in the prison system. There's particular needs for women that are just not being met in the prison system as designed and implemented today. And the last chapter was challenges and opportunity of reentry that also there are a lot of issues there that just the, the general public just does not know. Just to give you an example, some of the lawyers that defended some of the women in the exhibition had no idea that they were having such challenges at the reentry part of, of their journey. So those were the four themes that we developed in the exhibition that is currently on view at the Ford Foundation. And I just wanna acknowledge that Lisa Kim, the director of the Ford Foundation Gallery is here in the audience as well. And um, now I wanna uh, pass the, the microphone to Ron Therim and to Ron Bechet, who are two of the artists that took up this challenge. We were like, you know, uh, we, you are a wonderful artist on your own, renowned, respected in the community. Can you suspend your artistic practice and deploy all your artistic skills towards telling the story of a formerly incarcerated woman. And you know, some of the artists felt they had a level of competency to, to rise up to the challenge, and some other artists just had to find their own competency by developing a relationship with a persister and turning their story into an artwork. And so that was a whole journey on its own that I want to run Therim and, and Ron to share a little bit of, of that. And I'm, I'm gonna start with, with Ron. Uh, Beche, and then we'll go to Ron Therim because we will see a little bit of a video also of, of Ron Therim interacting with his persister. So Ron, do you mind sharing with us what that journey was uh, building trust with your persister? Sure. Um, my persister was uh, Desiree Morrison, um, who at the time of her uh, incident her, and subsequent incarceration was a mother of three. And um, she had some circumstances that were um, not, uh, I guess, it had to do with uh, Katrina. Um, and some things that all of us were uh, 
a part of at the time of Katrina, where she was uh, actually convicted of trespassing uh, and served six years um, and some other things. And so um, she were, was um, in a situation where um, uh, because of being a black woman, um, the police officer arrested her for things that all of us were doing at the time, which was uh, dumpster diving and, <laughs> and finding things that, you know, uh, possibly could be salvaged and saved. And so um, that to me was just um, egregious and just um, took me on a journey with her to understand what that was like um, to be in, in that particular predicament. Um, and so she was in prison from 2006 to 2012. Um, which uh, for six years. And so that just really um, threw me for a loop. But, you know, we, we took some time. We first contacted each other on the phone. Um, and um, I read her story before I actually met her. And uh, she read my story before uh, we met. And so we were able to ask each other um, questions about um, our life's journey and uh, things that were important to us in this uh, process of making this particular piece. I also thought that, you know, um, yes, I'm an artist and I make things, and I usually make things um, myself. Um, sometimes I incorporate other people, but this, I really felt it was important for, for us to make uh, somewhat together. Yes, through my hands, but also through our minds together and our souls together. And so, you know, that process was part of this. And so um, we, we talked a lot about what, what should this represent? What should it uh, mean? And, and, and the spiritual nature, because we both felt like it needed to be something that was that touched on not just the story, but, but the, 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 the survival, um, the actual meaning of being able to move from uh, what it was it like to, to have to do this and then have to survive through this uh, with her children. Uh, so I thought that, that was a really important part of what needed to be done. And so did uh, Desiree. Uh, so um, the piece that we made, um, it, it hopefully um, sort of pulls that spirit, that, that understanding of, of that, um, um, and I'm not referring to it in a uh, sort of formal religious sense, but also, uh, but how that we see each other um, through uh, how we survive each day and how we survive uh, through our life's journey. And I thought it was important because Desiree, to me, was this very strong woman. Um, who, uh, at the time when, when she was arrested, they also took her, her child that was with her um, off to the juvenile justice center. Uh, and uh, so she, nobody knew what had happened to her for days uh, before she was able to reach somebody to let them know what had happened to her. So she just basically disappeared. And she had two other children that were not with her at the time of her arrest that just were um, not knowing what happened to their mother. And so uh, that kind of, uh, what does it take to get through that kind of incident um, in your life? And um, I guess I know things from one end. Um, my mother, uh, who recently passed, was the first black uh, female police officer uh, commissioned in New Orleans. And so, you know, I, and she was kind of um, forward thinking and, um, and community policing at the time. Um, and uh, I guess I knew it from that end. And uh, after Katrina to myself, uh, I had been arrested uh, and, <laughs> uh, and put in prison for, for a, a day. Uh, and so uh, I kind of was thinking about, wow, what would it be like for, for me to have to experience, you know, the number of days that she did uh, for something that, that was um, a very minor as well. And so my, my incident also was very minor, but, but that's what we were trying to accomplish was this kind of uh, spiritual thing. And also to my wife, uh, Troy uh, Bichet also helped us in kind of understanding what, would, what is a restorative conversation about in having these things. And so um, we were able to kind of have that conversation and, and really think through what this thing might look like. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, you know, I would like to encourage the audience to ask questions of us since we have so many talented artists and directly impacted folks in the room. But I wanted to now go to Ron Therim 
and ask Ron Therim if he can share his thoughts with us. Ron, Ron Therim was actually the first artist we approached uh, with this idea. He was the first artist to say yes. And he was also the first artist to actually interview his per sister and get to know her. So uh, we were all curious about how that what, what the questions, what the conversation was going to be between them and how that was going to play out before we, we went and engaged 30 more formerly incarcerated women and 30 more artists. So uh, Ron Therim, would you mind sharing with us your, your process of meeting Bobby Jean Johnson and, and telling us a little bit more about Bobby Jean, who's not here with us anymore? Yeah, for me, um, I mean, I did have the privilege of meeting her in person um, for the the start of this project. Um, and there was the pressure that uh, Sarita and Delphinette sort of mentioned of like skepticism that I felt kind of, I had to sort of, you know, I don't know, like confront. And so it was that pressure of like, you know, what will my creative talent be able to bring to her story look like? And, and so, so some of the, the conversations was sharing with her my approach to art making. And I had, a, you know, previously read interviews that um, were transcribed and, uh, and then read some of her story. And so with that, the, the conversation we had was sort of just kind of narrowing it down. Um, I mean, Bobby Jean, sort of looking at her story of being arrested at like the age of 19 and spending upwards of 41 years in prison. For me, um, that was my whole lifetime to sort of think about, you know, her spending my whole lifetime uh, sort of confined to the bars. Um, and so, so really the question I had for her was like, who does she want to, this this work to reach. I mean, there's there's a lot of angles. I mean, her story and the way it played out um, could address you know corruption in the police department, just just all these different you know systematic issues. But she she instead wanted to focus on young women uh, who were around the age she was uh, when she went in, and her thoughts was that if her story can prevent them from sort of experiencing the same situation that she experienced, then that that would be the goal of the work. And so, so that's where I set my thoughts on focusing on uh, young women who are it's about that age, uh, as I thought about the concept for the piece. Um, and I mean, the piece itself, it, it started out thinking about uh, just, I mean, 19, her story, she was pulled over with, uh, you know, guys that she knew for, said to be a broken tail light, and there was a gun and a knife that was put in her purse. They were all taken into custody. And the gun, you know, and the knife had uh, were said to have charges on them, and so because they were in her purse, even though um, one of the other guys confessed to the ownership of those items, she was still forced uh, to confess to the charges that that existed on those those weapons um, through force, through you know abuse uh, of the interrogating police through being suffocated by a plastic bag and a garbage can in the room. Um, and so all that, you know, to sort of get her to confess to this thing that she didn't do and, and take 41 years of her life. So it's kind of taking that, the, the gravity of that story and trying to figure out how to represent that in an artistic way, the goal was uh, sort of looking at aspects of her story. So thinking about these accessories, you know, these things you would find in a purse. It, it was like um, thinking about, you know, I don't know, compact or, you know, a brush or these things. Uh, 
that you find in a person. So I started there thinking about accessories and then also thinking about the the age is like 18, 19, you're, you're graduating high school, you're thinking about prom. And so the dress form kind of came to mind sort of. Uh, uh, Ron Therry, sorry to, I just want to let people know that your piece is that image that they see right now on Zoom, right? Are you able to see the same screen? Are we all able to see? Yes. Uh, um, is this sculpture that looks like a, a piece of a chess game. And um, I'm not sure we have a Zoom in. We'll see it in a little video later on. But I just wanted to point out that the piece that Ron Therim is talking about is this black piece that we see at the end. Um, and then has, uh, the, there's these lines that you see falling from, it's, it's their handles from a purse. That's a purse that Ron Therim is talking mm -hmm. to about. And the compact that you should find in this purse is what's crowning uh, the top of the piece. And so I just wanted to give a visual and let everyone know um, that this, uh, this is a visual cue for the work that you're talking about. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, thank you. Um, I mean, and so the piece, uh, also thinking about the, the sort of that time before and this time now, uh, the, the title of the piece, uh, All Black and Blue Bruises of a Queen's Crown, sort of was sort of thinking about, you know, how much, you know, time hasn't changed in the circumstances uh, from then to now. Um, as you know, the debates of you know who life matters continues. Um, but looking at it from this this also way, uh, the artistic this like artist or art way of like the role that art plays in sort of highlighting issues and sort of in the same way that maybe um, I think bruises function for sort of the human body, you know, um, and the discoloration of a bruise signifies that there's an issue, there's, there's, there's something to sort of pay attention and you know, to sort of address in that area. And so I think sort of looking at the role of a lot of the work in this exhibition uh, function in that way, it's like sort of shining light on areas that, uh, that should be addressed and resolved. And, and so that was also another added sort of pressure of the work to sort of honor the issue that, you know, at least, you know, as many of them as possible um, with the content of its sort of appearance. Um, right. But Thank you, I mean, this piece was made more than a year ago. And it's just so interesting how, as Chandra and Keith were saying, some issues remain so relevant today, right? And it's like time has not passed and how we need to continue working on some of these issues. Uh, I just wanna also show like the video run through where you're interacting with, with uh, but I wanted to ask um, uh, Catherine, if you can show some of the images of the exhibition really quick, just to give folks a sense of, one of the questions we had from audience, even from the persisters and the, uh, the women we were talking uh, to, was like, what is this exhibition gonna look like, right? We were really worried about the tone and how we were going, what, what would a, an exhibition on mass incarceration look like? And some folks uh, were a little concerned about what those visuals might be. And so I just wanna give a sense, if you can keep on scrolling, this is what an exhibition looks like. Artists are so incredibly talented at creating extremely beautiful metaphors to talk about very difficult issues that this is how art can be deployed actually to build community, to help us have a safe space where we can actually be talking about the artwork. Maybe instead of you know, how we don't agree or how we agree, we can use art as a metaphor, as a channel of, as a vehicle of communication. Um, so I just wanted to show you what the exhibition looks like right now uh, at the Ford Foundation and how we can actually through a very visually striking artistic masterpieces also, like the fact that they're visually striking and beautiful doesn't mean that they're superficial or banal. On the contrary, they're incredibly deep and powerful, and yet they, they have this power to bring us into the artwork, to be able to go deep into them and be able to have those difficult conversations. So I just wanted to share that with the audience to see, you know, these 30 artists from New Orleans, this is what they delivered, hoping to tell the story of the women in their own communities, right? The care for being, for, and the willingness to give back and tell those stories of community 
of our communities that remain invisible and that we don't know who they are precisely because they're in isolation and confinement and how we as museums can help tell those stories in an accurate manner uh, in a self-representation kind of way. And um, so I just wanted to close uh, the contribution before we open questions to the public, a little video of actually Ron Therim and uh, Bobby Jean Johnson, who I, I have to say that by chance, the two women that we were discussing today in the Persister exhibition were actually uh, uh, innocent of the crimes that they were com convicted for, uh, which is something that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about the, the incarceration and, and our the popular imaginary of who are the folks that are living in, in incarceration systems. You know, we have these two examples that prob that break the that challenges the stereotype of what we uninformed um, layperson may have. And, uh, and Sarita and Delphine can certainly, you know, uh, keep us clear on, on, on that message. Uh, I wanted to show the video of, of Bobby Jean Johnson because- Monica, Before you show the video, I just wanted to say really quickly, like we never discussed how we actually chose to focus on women um, for the exhibit. And we were, um, and I just wanted to center the conversation in that too. The reason that we chose women was for the sole purpose of when you talk about mass incarceration, a lot of people talk about black men and that is the first thought that comes to mind as if women do not go to prison. And we know that because the rate has risen <clears throat> so high in the last 40 years that we can clearly see that if we don't believe that women are inherently worse now than they were 40 years ago, that the systems are now coming after women because the men are now unavailable. But it's as if the community and people at large do not know that women also go to prison. And a lot of times the conditions that women are in prison in are far worse than the conditions that men are in prison in. Like, you know, for instance, we had a chance to see like Angola and the things that go on there, but none of those services like I don't believe in the rodeo myself personally, but the women don't even have an opportunity to do work release or have a rodeo or bring an income. So they are in these conditions where they are in extreme poverty, where they can't even buy sanitary napkins and tampons and just things like that. And it was just so important for us to include that in this exhibit. So I just wanted to make sure that I said that, Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Sarita. As always, you know, uh, we become silent and we listen to you every time you take the microphone, Sirita. Thank you. And it goes back to what we want to talk about, Bobby Jean Johnson, is also an issue that Sirita was just pointing out. Like, why, why are women, uh, that women are not being served uh, at all in the prison system to meet any of their needs? That includes healthcare and healthcare, particularly for women prenatal, postnatal, gynecologist. In the case of, of Bobby Jean Johnson, she went into the prison system as a 19 year, healthy 19-year-old. She came out of the prison system 40 years later with HIV, hepatitis C, and, uh, and, um, and needing dialysis. That's who we met. And uh, that's who she is right now when she's talking with Ron Therim. And unfortunately, she passed away uh, some six months ago uh, given on the lack of health care in the prison system. And so we just want to show you how she felt about the exhibition, what this art meant to her and what her whole life journey meant to her at, at this moment, which is probably, um, you know, some four months before she passed away. So if we can take three minutes to honor, honor Bobby Jean Johnson's uh, journey through, through our world. Thank you. And I thank you. Because some people don't come out, like they come out negative, yeah, hatred, and stuff in their lives. But like I used to tell them, if I can forgive people, and y'all know I've been here for them, I didn't. I say, look, you got to forgive. You want God to forgive you? You got to forgive. Them people was only doing what they thought they were was right. And some of them knew it wasn't right, but they still did it. Yeah. And you just got to forgive and go ahead on with your life. Yeah, they're rolling it. Yeah. So they got to live with that. They didn't know it was wrong. Correct. They have to look yeah. at this decision. So, yeah. I try to make the opposite about it. Even though they didn't mean it, I try not to be negative on me. I just put that behind and go ahead on with my life. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
knew she was sick and I think she knew she was very sick perhaps before right before she died and about a week before she died she she called me and she told me um that she forgave everybody she forgave the prosecutors and she forgave the police and she forgave everyone who contributed to what had happened to her and she really meant that she was really saying that in quite a profound way and she just embraced everybody I think it's actually across the board for men and women in terms of the the problems with medical care in prison and it's a, a very consistent story actually amongst those who are exonerated and released they untreated health issues that persist for many years and so when they're released they're sick and Bobby wasn't diagnosed with hepatitis C until after her release and her kidneys were failing. She was on dialysis in no time. And when we look at long-term health disparities and over-incarceration, there's clear links between bad health outcomes and incarceration. Earlier this year, the federal court found the men's prison system to be unconstitutional and inadequate in terms of its health care. It's an, it's an ongoing situation and it's another way that over-incarceration really hinders people's ability, like Bobby's, to thrive when they finally do win their release. May y'all be blessed. Be blessed. I love y'all and I miss y'all a lot. May God continue to bless y'all in a very mighty way. In Jesus' name. Dolphinette, your micro Dolphinette, you wanted to say something? Absolutely. You know, Dolphinette always wants to say something about this type of conversation. Uh, because it's deep and it's real. And oftentimes we fly past the conversation of women being incarcerated, being abused, being sexually exploited inside of prisons, being used as slaves, uh, extracting slave labor from women. And, you know, I echo what Sarita said about when we have these conversations, how we oftentimes, because historically, uh, systems have been snatching men, black men, out of homes uh, in, the, in an effort to uh, disrupt that home. And they were successful in doing that. But when they saw that, when they snatched those men and the disruption didn't last, they began to snatch the women because they knew if we take the woman from the house, we will completely break up that household. And that's the conversation that we're missing. And those are the conversations that we're flying past. And oftentimes, you know, y'all know I get so emotional about this. Because I was a woman with five children left to be imprisoned for seven years, four months, and 28 days for some clothes that I didn't even get to take out of a store. So we can talk about, you know, as a society that, well, she broke the law. How many of us have taken something, whether it's an ink pen from work? or a loaf of bread from the store. But was it worth seven years, a combined 12 years in prison? And that's the type of sentences that women are getting when they're trying to survive. When they're waking up every day trying to survive. And the whole, you know, the whole piece about you know, the uh, the sugar canes, uh, Chandra and, uh, and Keith, you're absolutely right. I today am diagnosed with a chronic back issue due to that same kind of label in prison. You know, we talked about how access to Angola for men like Norris and Calvin, and these guys that are fighting for the men they left behind, it took damn near an act of Congress for me and Sarita to get into the LCIW just to talk to the women. Mm -hmm. 
just to talk to him. And more so than anything, we're finding that women prisons are ran punitively. There is no such thing as trying to create a stronger, healthier woman. Everything has punitive outcomes. If I share a piece of bread with Sarita in a prison, I will face disciplinary actions if I'm caught. And so then I have to worry about, will I see my child? Because Sarita just needed one more piece of bread. Angola don't have those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. LCIW does. LCIW is a Louisiana, um, what is LCIW? It's Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women. And they have been flooded and not in their main building for over three years now. So they're housed at Hunt Correctional Facility, which is a male facility. So they're back off in the corner in this one little building and hoping every day that they can still wake up and be treated with the hum humanity and the dignity that they deserve to be treated with. Those women are being diagnosed with COVID. Of course they are. 97 women have tested. They are crammed up in one building, sharing these same facilities, waiting for their test results. So if they wasn't positive when they took the test, they damn sure positive now. And it just, you know, repeatedly, we have these conversations. And, you know, I want, I, I truly appreciate the real for doing this. But even now, we were gonna, gonna just skirt on by. Hmm. What's going on with women in these facilities? And Sarita and I agreed to do the exhibition because finally, Somebody asked us to share the traumas, the stories, the life skills, the lack of life skills that women have and where it is rooted at. It's all rooted in trauma, all of it. And there with, with Bobby Jean, for instance, were thrown inside prisons, abused, held care for women I don't know if you all know this, but the doctors in the prisons, none of them have their license. That's where they send those folks. The people that you read about whose licenses have been suspended, that's where they send them. To use us as guinea pigs. That's if they decide to see us. That's if the guard that's in the, the, the uh, infirmary that day feels like letting me see the doctor. Because they make the decision on whether or not I see the doctor. The guard does. And so because women's bodies and our issues are so complex, of course, Bobby came home and died. Because for so long, nobody cared enough. You know, in order to have a pap smear in a women's prison, something has to be wrong for you, with you a long time. I'm just going to put that out there. In order for you to get a mammogram, there has to be extreme pain. And you all know at that time, by that time, you probably have stage three, stage four cancer, probably. But it's only then will you get those services if the God decides you need to see the doctor. Dolphinette and Sarita, what can, what can we do? I mean, I do want to open at this point the conversation, if I may, Andrea, and if everyone agrees. Um, we want to know, like besides, you know, in my professional life, making sure I do an exhibition about these issues, right? Let's, but the folks in the room right now, we have about like almost 100 folks in the room. What do we need to know what we can do um, besides proactively becoming more educated, of course, um, and knowing that a lot of these issues remain in the hands of locally elected officials and making sure that we are better informed of that, and supporting your organizations, you know, Operation Restoration, Women with a Vision, Vote NOLA, you know, what, what can we do? Like for, for many of us, we're listening to this for the first time and we are appalled and wanna, we want to do something. What, where should we start? We can start by when we have these conversations, 
understanding that th women are suffering as much or if not more inside of these prisons as our male counterparts are. And know that when we come and you see that when you go and see the exhibition as beautiful as it is, those stories are deeply rooted in trauma and begin to focus on the issues of women, gender specific issues of women who are incarcerated. And when they come out and, and, and expect it to re-enter, they don't have the support. That was beautiful to support Gary Tyler guy. Bobby Jean didn't have that. Yeah. I just would like to add also, um, we know that, you know, 50% of change is gonna happen in the courtroom and the other 50% of change will happen through policy and elections and things of the sort. So um, I always encourage people that where you have a particular realm of expertise, how can you deploy your expertise as it relates to social justice um, issues and how you can affect change? So for instance, we do have an organization in New Orleans um, called Operation Restoration, and we focus on women and girls unapologetically, specifically, who have been involved in the uh, criminal legal system. We, not by choice, but by force, have 15 programs that we run to address different barriers. You know, we have uh, 16 full-time staff members, 80% of the staff are formerly incarcerated or directly impacted women. We have about 20 contractors that we work with across the country to do policy initiatives that we have now passed and are working to pass in different localities and different areas around the country. Um, we have been able to pass legislation in Louisiana that uh, removes the question around criminal history off of college applications. We have uh, been able to pass legislation that stops prisons from charging for pads and tampons. We created a Louisiana Incarcerated Women's Task Force um, to address the needs specifically of incarcerated women, and we are trying to replicate these policies across the country. So specifically the legislation around removing the question off the college application, we've been successful working with advocates on the ground to pass it in four other four states. Uh, as well. So we have goals to expand throughout the country. We're working on a federal level to get Pell Grants um, reinstituted to people who are currently incarcerated. We run the Unlock Higher Ed campaign where we really focus on removing as many barriers to higher education as possible. Um, and we just do a lot of work inside and around the country in the state of Louisiana and as a, as a whole. But it's not enough, you know. So I always encourage people when they walk up and they say, hey, how can I help? If your expertise is in teaching, volunteer in these organizations and contribute to teaching um, courses and classes. If it's in, you know, we have a closet where I know when I got out of prison, I didn't even know how to determine what bra size I was in and how humiliating that was and how I didn't know how to turn on a computer and just being able to uh, help women with those things. We have a lot of people who are into fashion design. How can you create clothing, give clothing? We give away free clothing at no cost. We give away hygiene items, uh, purses, wigs, whatever it is for a woman to feel like a woman again and making those things as accessible as possible. So, you know, I often tell people when they say, well, I don't know what to do. It is always go back to what it is that you know how to do and target that population that needs that help for that particular um, service because all it takes is for you to feel like you can change the problem and you will. You know, so uh, for me, for all everybody who's listening, if your strength is in capital, then share your capital. If your strength is in how to build a business, help people build a business because we know there are discriminatory practices that are deployed against people who are incarcerated all the way from housing to education to jobs, all of your constitutional rights or, you know, virtually wiped away. You know, I, I went back to school. I got my degree in clinical laboratory science. I'm in the hospital saving lives, working in a lab and I couldn't even vote. You know, so I'm paying taxes and just different things. So now that I can, I make sure that I always go and I vote and I participate in those processes. So just making sure that you are aware of the inadequate inadequacies, even inside your own institutions that you run. You know, if you run a bank, why would you need to ask a person on your application? Have you been convicted of a crime? The only crime you should be concerned about is if they stole money from a bank. You know, so how can you make that specific? You know, it shouldn't matter if they smoke marijuana or not. 
you know, so really thinking about how you can make small changes within your businesses and institutions and reach and start there and then making that wider um, movement. Thank you, Sarita. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's important to mention that it, it's up to all of us to do our part, right? And it, we can start with exactly at home, what are our skill sets? And we cannot be waiting for, you know, this one unifying leader figure. If we all start within what's possible in our personal lives, then we will, we will see change. Um, not to speak for directly impacted folks, but we live, you know, what I've heard in this starting to do this kind of work is like, well, uh, folks, we've, when we visited Angola, the museum staff visited Angola to talk to the residents of the Angola prison um, to see what we could do. And, and one of the comments that came back is like, you need to stop asking us, you know, the directly impacted folks um, uh, to go out there and inform people and educate people. Like, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can, you know, with what, with what we have. It has to be the non-directly impacted folks that also start taking this seriously as if they were directly impacted and trying to find a way within their own, you know, life journeys to be part of the solution, right? We cannot be waiting for, for this great leader to come and tell us what to do. No, Sarita, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, and then just the whole thing about expertise and who we view as experts, like you don't have to get your expertise out of a book, you don't have to have these letters behind your name to be an expert in incarceration and being formerly incarcerated and people who are formerly incarcerated and doing the work and knows what, and know what it takes and the things that are needed should be valued as experts in the same manner, compensated as experts in the same manner and moving away from this ideology that we're going to continue to oppress and continue to um, you know, extract information from folks on how we can do things and continue in the cycle of really, you know, oppressing folks and, and really stealing information from them and not really valuing, you know, who it is that is saying it because of their lived experience. So um, it's always about shifting the narrative around who you view as an expert as well. So I think what, what comes next, Andre, correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to play just a little bit of a, of a song. Uh, in the Persister exhibition, we included music as one of, as, a, as a general of art that would interpret one of the Persister stories for them. And so I just, we wanted to play a little bit of a, a jazz composition. And while you all send us questions, what comes now is a conversation with the audience in this room uh, to us, to our, to our presenters. So let's listen to a little bit of music while you send us some questions and we can continually with the conversation, more addressing, uh, um, you know, questions from, from the audience. I'd like to pose a question just really for all of the artists who and, and participants here. Um, you know, I had the, the privilege of going to see Persister together with my children. You, you hosted a number of family days at Newcomb. Um, 
and and we uh, attended all of them and it was I think one of the most um, compelling elements of this particular project was the way that it brought so many different communities together to hear so many stories and you and I in preparation for today talked a lot about um, the rendering visible um, what is um, commonly either ignored or or not before a general public's eyes and this is certainly for me like the knowledge that i gained from working so closely with keith and chandra's archive um, this is the knowledge that was afforded to the public through the 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 artistic renderings uh included in persister so you know um ron theron and ron maybe maybe you can speak a little bit about um and also keith and chandra what it means to make um to make visible this this set of circumstances, these social conditions, um, what are the kind of formal tools um, that you employ to share this, this knowledge with the broader public? Excuse me. Well, I think it was the, the biggest tool for me was an open mind, um, was to try and, and get there with, without having any um, pre-notions pre of what this was about. Um, that was the, the most difficult uh, thing and the hardest tool to bring. Uh, but, I, you know, what I what found too with, with Desiree was, was so beautiful and with a lot of the women that um, Desiree, you know, the, people, the piece is titled No Pity Party because, um, you know, she had no um, ill will toward the person that arrested her. Um, you know, she basically um, was forgiving about this whole incident and went on to write a book about it. Uh, and about her life. And so, you know, that to me was just amazing, uh, that kind of a tool. But also too, I think, you know, um, being spiritually connected in some way as well was also a, another important tool to bring to the table. And I think for me too, the one thought was just sort of approaching the situation with um, empathy um, because one of the pressures I had was just this idea of being a male and um, given the opportunity the responsibility to tell the story uh, or experience of a female. And so to me, that held a lot of weight. Um, and like Sarita said, we, we have different skill sets to, to sort of bring to situations. And so as a visual artist, you know, I don't have the law degree and I don't have, you know, sort of the skill sets that affects change in other areas of, you know, the criminal justice system. And so for me as an artist, my tool is that of visual, you know, creations and having those creations. Some, you know, the taking the prompt for those people who make me aware of conditions and issues that need, uh, to have a light shined on them is um, one of the tools, sort of understanding what needs to be, you know, discussed, what needs to be shared, what needs to be brought out and open to a, a larger audience, and sort of taking that information and then using my skill set as a visual artist to sort of try to expose those conditions to a larger audience in the best way, you know, my creative skills can. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, Andrew, you might have to repeat the question for Keith uh, just in detail, but I think that Ron and Ron, Theron and Ron uh, Bichet touched on it so much. Uh, it comes from a spiritual level of also um, being able to convey what, what, what that person wants to say or, or what we need to say while we were there in Angola um, is, is, is part of how we did it. And, and, and being a visual artist, trying to show um, the people who we photograph in the best light, you know, and with dignity and be able to tell their stories, um, not just coming from us and being able to convey that through the photographs is what um what i what i was actually how i worked and 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 chose and to do it with the tools that i did as a camera with a camera as gordon polk said 
the camera is just as powerful as any, you know, AK-47. I mean, we've been fortunate. And now it's better because kids today, they have more access to, I mean, the quality of the cell phone make me want to almost junk some of this stuff. I didn't spend four and five thousand dollars for us though. We was able to use the cameras as our weapon to, to convey what, what we feeling about our people and our conditions. And I've been blessed that we've been able to meet so many people to help us along that way. I want to say, um, I know we're, we're approaching the end of this, of our time to speak today. Um, uh, I think I speak on Monica's behalf as well to say that both of our experiences in witnessing these, this body, these bodies of work has been um, the recognition of the kind of trust that is uh, required to realize this to, to realize this kind of art that takes on subjecthood of this kind. Um, you know, I, it's one of the first things I knew about your work, Keith and Chandra, is the trust that you developed between your subject and 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 yourselves, um, both. Um, in that moment of photography, but also in, in developing relationships that extend far beyond. Um, and I, I have learned so much from Monica and from the Persister show and Sarita and Delphine, like all the way that the, the kind of in, the, the bedrock of trust that was required to, to um, afford this kind of visibility. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for, for participating today. Um, I believe, um, to, to the team at the rail, we give our thanks and, and I believe we close, conclude today with, with, some, with a poem. Is that correct? Yes, uh, at the rail we do, we do have a tradition of concluding each of these events with a poem. Um, today, the rail's publisher, Fong, will read a poem before we leave. But I just want to say thank you to all of you, Sarita, Delfinette, Ron, Lantharin, Keith, Chandra, Andrea, Monica. This, this has been just such, such a powerful hour, hour and a half. I mean, really just, and like they, I'm kind of at a loss for words. Uh, I'll be more coherent in a bit. But um, our country, I think, I think we know is cruel. Uh, its systems are cruel, and I think maybe also now we are at a point where some things can change. Um, and gatherings like these just feel feel so important as we figure out how to move forward. Um, before I go to Fong, I also want to say we're putting the link to donate to Operate Restoration in the chat. Um, so that should be right here. Uh, if people if people want to do that. Um, and yes, so we do do these talks at 1 p.m. every day, and tomorrow we have a conversation with artists Martha Tuttle and Susan Harris. Um, but everyone today, thank you. This was, was so immensely powerful. Uh, and Fong, I will hand it over to you if you'd like to say a few, a few words. I'll say something before we end. Uh, oh, for sure, yes. Always when for everyone that's on this call, whenever you see my name on anything, a panel of any kind, please expect the absolute unapologetic truth. Uh, and it comes from uh, the, the suffrage. You know, I, I have, I'm experienced and I'm the expert in this. I walk in this every day, all day. And I work with women. Uh, suffering. They have not gotten strong enough to speak to you all about their suffrage. And so they depend on us to speak for them. And when I uh, relay what we have gone through, what we're going through, um, it is with passion because in my soul, I believe in us. Mm -hmm. Because everyone else did not. Thank you all for having us today. Well, we believe in you. It's not that we can change, we must change. We will make the change. And thank you so much, Andrea, also Monica, Ron, Sarita, Chandra, Keith, for a compelling, very profound conversation of the most difficult subject, but one that we will learn and will change us. And we will change 
the world we live in. All is unjust. So I like to read this poem just because I remember reading it in my poetry class in 1982. I was in college with a <coughs> poet, Stephen Burke, who really introduced me to poetry. And it was this very poem written during the Great Depression, probably 1935, when Langston Hughes was taking a train from New York City to Ohio. So it's a long trip. He wrote this poem that we all know. Uh, it's not the poem that only reflects on his life, struggling, you know, at the young, struggling poet. He was 33 or 34 at the time. But also the disillusionment of the American dream that failed to fulfill its promise of freedom and equality. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, sick in a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream, the dreamers ramped. Let it be the great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrant scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It was never America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wretch. No opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that drove your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fool and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scar. I'm the red man driven from the land. I'm the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plane of dog eat dog of mighty cross the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless change of profit, power, Gain of grab the land, of grab the goal, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the man, of take the pay, of owning everything, or for our own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil, and the worker sold to the machine. I'm the negro, servant to you all. I'm the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry, yet today, despite the dream. Beaten yesterday, all oh, pioneers, I'm the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bothered through the years. Yes, I am the one who dreamt the basic dream of the old world while still the serf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true. And even yet, it's mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turn that's make America the land it has become. Oh, I'm man who sailed those early seas in such what I have meant to be the home, the my home, for I am who the left island shore, the Poland's plain, and inland glassy glee, and torn the black Africa strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free. Who say the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions of relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we have dreamt, for all the songs we sung, for all the songs we held, of all the flag we have hung up, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never been been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose fate and pain, whose hand at the foundry, who's blown in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose, the steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like liches on the people's lives, must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it's plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be, out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rib that rocked the grab and the stout that lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plain, the rivers, the mountains, 
and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fong. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're now going to allow everyone to give, like we're giving permission so that everyone can turn their microphone on if people just want to quickly say goodbye or say anything. Uh, so you should all be able to activate your mics. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Keith and Chandra. Thank you, Santa, Dolphinette. Keep coming, Mama. Oh, my dad. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, Roxanne. Hi. Pleasure to see you. Thank you to everyone who came. Hi, Keith and Chandra. Keith and Chandra, I'm so glad we got we got you guys here today too. It was a pleasure to be Thank you, Keith and Chandra. Andra. Great to see you. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, so Thank you, Andrea. This was so fun to organize with you. I Thank hope you good. Good. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. Everyone stay in touch and please keep us posted with what you're doing. Um, I'm very excited to share the link to Operation Restoration with all my friends and family and consider doing the same. <laughs>